Okay, uh, welcome to Power to Stand. This is the name of our new adult Bible fellowship class. Uh, you can call it the adult Sunday school class if that terminology is more familiar to you. This is the class that uh, Pastor Steve and I have been talking about for months. Uh, we've uh, been progressively getting more and more excited about it in terms of what God has laid uh, on our hearts. Uh, essentially, what this class is designed to do is to examine what the Word of God has to say about living the Christian life in the last days. So we'll be looking at the Word of God. Uh, we'll be looking at the prophetic word, uh, m- you know, much of the time, and finding that the, the prophetic word has a lot to say about living the Christian life uh, in, in the times in which we live. Now, this lines up very nicely with the philosophy of ministry of our church, which is founded upon uh, three separate pillars. One having to do with the proclamation of the inerrant, infallible, inspired, and sufficient Word of God. Two, proclamation, consistent proclamation of the good news or gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. And then three, encouraging believers to live their lives for God, to live in righteousness and holiness until the return of Jesus Christ for his bride. And so this particular class will embrace all three of those pillars at one time or another. And it'll be talking about what some of us sometimes refer to as sanctification. Sanctification. So to begin, I want to share with you uh, a phenomenon in, in the New Testament dealing with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Many times when the the writers of the New Testament talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ, they do so with a view toward giving instruction for the Christian life. Uh, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, where, um, where I can illustrate this from an overview point of view uh, before we actually go to 1 John chapter 5 and uh, spend some time in that epistle. The book of 1 Thessalonians uh, is a a book that is quite eschatological, dealing with the last things. And at the end of, or the conclusion of every chapter, Paul emphasizes the return of Christ, the appearing of Christ, the coming of Christ uh, to the church, which is uh, at Thessalonica. Look at verses 9 and 10 of chapter 1. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then look at verses 19 and 20 of chapter 2. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of of our Lord Jesus at his coming, for you are our glory and joy. And then chapter 3, the, uh, one of the verses that I have highlighted on the whiteboard up here, chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That's talking about the second coming of Christ. One of the purposes of the second coming of Christ is to complete that process that we call sanctification, complete that process that we call the Christian life, to complete uh, the, uh, the task of preparing 
the bride of Christ to be spiritually wed to her husband. The, the Christian life can be looked at uh, in, in this way. It's the process of, of all of us donning our wedding clothes, our wedding garments, our garments of righteousness, our garments of holiness, as we become more and more like our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 3 ends with uh, a reference to the second coming of Christ, and the, the Apostle Paul emphasizes the Christian life that, uh, that the Lord, in verse 12, cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. That's one of the one another commands. And that one another command is in the context of the second coming of Jesus Christ. As we think about, as we dwell upon the second coming of Christ, it ought to motivate us to love one another more than we did before we thought about that coming. You understand the connection there? The more we think about Jesus Christ, the greater our capacity will be to love brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. That's what it's designed to do, to make us more like Christ, to set us apart or to sanctify us. Then the Apostle Paul has a lengthy section about sanctification in chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. And you can read that uh, either later today or maybe sometime this week. But he mentions sanctification in verse 3, in verse 6, and verse 7. It's God's will for us. Our sanctification. God's will for us is to live the Christian life. And then he concludes the chapter with one of the most well-known passages on the rapture, or what we sometimes refer to as the harpazo, the rapture of the church, in verses 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For we believe that, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then what does Paul tell the believers at Thessalonica to do? Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with the words of the second coming of Jesus Christ, with the words of the rapture and the resurrection of the body of Christ. Comfort and encourage and strengthen one another with these words. You've heard from Pastor Steve and from John on multiple occasions that there are many people within the professing church that downplay, even downgrade, the prophetic word. God's word does no such thing. God's word elevates prophecy. It has a particular purpose, and it has a particular purpose for those of us who are living in the last days. As we get closer and closer to the return of Christ, it is more and more important that we encourage one another and that we encourage one another in the Word of God. All right, and then a final reference 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, or set you apart entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of prophecy is to teach us how to live today in light of what God says may happen tomorrow. Or if you want to put it in another way, 
The purpose of prophecy is to live today in light of what God says will happen in the future. That's probably a better way to say it. It's to have a practical impact on our lives as we live for Jesus Christ. Now, in the half hour that's been allotted to me uh, this morning, I may have time to circle back to 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, if, I don't, if I don't get back to 1 Thessalonians 5 this morning, that's where I'll pick up next week, Pastor Steve, okay? Yeah. All right, now I want you to turn to um, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. And 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, is the purpose, uh, purpose verse or statement of purpose for John's first letter, first epistle. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. That's why John wrote the entire book. Verse 13 of chapter 5 tells us why he wrote the entire book of 1 John. Now, when you look at this verse, you should automatically and immediately think of two other verses. I want you to keep your place here in 1 John chapter 5 and turn back to the Gospel of John and chapter 20. John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. This is John's purpose for writing the Gospel of John. This is why he recorded the things that he did about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So he he performed many more miracles than what John recorded. But these have been written, and he recorded seven miracles. Jesus performed many more miracles in the three and a half years of his public ministry. But these seven, John writes, have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, or Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Anointed One, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Why did he write the Gospel of John? so that we might believe correctly about the identity of Jesus Christ. And by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the anointed one, we might have eternal life in his name. We might be saved from our sin. So the Gospel of John tells us how to get saved, how to be forgiven, how to receive the gift of eternal life. Whereas... The book of 1 John gives us assurance that we are saved. Now, I want you to focus as best that you can because this particular verse is one that is misinterpreted much of the time. I have heard people that I admire and respect misinterpret this this verse in this passage, saying that it says something that it does not say. It does teach about assurance in the Christian life. And and sometimes it's presented like this. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? The person says yes. Then you can know that you have eternal life. That's not what that verse is saying. These things... 1 John 1.1 1, 1 to 1 John 5.12. These things I have written to you, and then who believe in the name of the Son of God modifies the people he's writing to. You see that? It modifies the pronoun you. And why has he written these things to these believers in the first century A.D.? in order that they may know that they have eternal life. Well, how can they know if they have eternal life? 
by examining 1 John 1, 1 to 1 John 5, 12 and looking at these tests and evidences of genuine faith. That's what the book of 1 John is all about. It's very practical. We can't have assurance apart from the Word of God. It doesn't work that way. It's not based on a feeling. It's based on the declared and sure and certain Word of God. We can have a certainty about our salvation. John tells us that. We can know that we have eternal life because he wrote an entire book in order that we might know. So it's more than just believe in the name of the Son of God. It's living the Christian life. It's being involved in the process of sanctification. It's having evidence that your life is being changed and transformed in the present. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. Now, with that in mind, I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 2. And I have something that, to share with you that uh, a passage that I've taught probably um, a dozen times or more in, in, the, in the last 40 years. I, have taught, I mean, I've taught this passage in depth. And never have I taught what I'm going to teach you this morning. The Lord gave me an insight on this passage that that I had failed to connect even though I know and understand the purpose verse of 1 John. There is a a passage beginning in uh, verse 28 of 1 John chapter 2 dealing with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now I want you, as we read this passage, or as I read it and you follow along, I want you to notice that the five verses that I'm going to read actually give us a test of genuine faith. And I had never looked at it that way before. But that indeed is what it is. Beginning with verse 28 of 1 John chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him or dwell in him. So that when he appears, that's the second coming of Christ, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Well, how will we not shrink away when Jesus comes? What does the Bible teach that we need to do as Christians? We need to abide in him. We need and, and we need to walk in holiness, and we need to be blameless, and we need to be righteous, right? All of those passages that deal with the second coming and and connect them with their Christian life, it, it talks about living for God in our Christian lives until either Christ returns or we die. Now, it's important that that we recognize that It's as we set ourselves apart through the Word of God, through the ministry of the Spirit of God, as we're being set apart by God through His Word and His Spirit, as we live the Christian life, we will be less and less inclined to shrink away in shame at the rapture. I mean, is this the position that you want to have? You know, don't come yet. I'm not ready. What's the message of the, of, of the New Testament regarding the second coming of Christ? It's to be ready, to be alert, to be prepared. Spiritual readiness. It's one of two major themes of the Olivet Discourse. That and do not be deceived. Do not be deceived by false teachers. Do not be, see, be deceived by false Christ. And then the positive side of that coin is be ready, be alert, be prepared, be watchful. You know, Jesus, Jesus hammers it like a bass drum, banging either side of that drum over and over and over again in the Olivet Discourse. He wants us to be prepared. He doesn't want us to shrink away when he comes. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. That's a test of the Christian life. 
Do you practice righteousness? If you do, now that doesn't mean you're sinless. It doesn't mean that you, you don't sometimes go down you know, a path that God doesn't want you to go. But what it does say, the characteristic of our life is that we desire righteousness. And over time, we become more and more righteous in our experience. God says that when we become believers in Jesus Christ, in our position, we are totally righteous. We exchange our sin for the righteousness of Christ. But the Christian life is designed for us to bring our experience closer and closer and closer to what God says is our position. Will our experience in this life ever reach what God says is our position? No. But that's the goal. And we're to get closer and closer and closer, and then God will finish that process either at our death or in a moment in time at the resurrection and rapture of the church. All right. Chapter 3. This, is again, is another example of an unfor- unfortunate chapter break. Uh, chapter breaks and verse divisions are not inspired. They aren't part of the original text. John is still in the same paragraph as he writes what we call chapter 3 and verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not as yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. Now, look at verse 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him namely Jesus Christ, purifies himself just as he is pure. Now that's talking about the Christian life. That's talking about sanctification. If we have our hope fixed on the return of Jesus Christ, knowing and understanding that we will be changed and transformed into the image of Jesus Christ instantaneously, when we meet him, when we see him face to face, if we have that hope fixed on Jesus Christ, it has the effect, it has the impact of making us more and more like Christ, making us more and more obedient to the Word of God, making us more and more sensitive to the leading and guiding of the Spirit of God in our lives. Thus, we become set apart. We become sanctified. And we become increasingly blameless as we live our lives for him. Now, here's the insight that the Lord, you know, laid on me. You know, my, my foot was elevated on, on our couch. I was supposed to keep my foot elevated. I had a little minor procedure on my big toenail of my right foot. And so I've got to wear sandals and keep my foot elevated when I'm sitting or laying down. And so I'm laying on the couch uh, in our family room, and my right foot is like, you know, about that much higher than my head, and it's a very uncomfortable position for me because I've got a, a bad lower back. And, and all of a sudden, I don't have my Bible, I don't have my iPad, I'm, I'm laying there, um, you know, I'm, I'm watching TV, and, you know, this thought jumps into my head, and I start thinking about this passage we just looked at in relation to the purpose verse. One of the evidences, one of the evidences of genuine faith is that we take the prophetic word and use it for its intended and designed purpose. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement. Now, I'm not saying that if someone ignores the prophetic word that they're an unbeliever. I'm not saying that. I mean, hear what I'm saying. I'm choosing my words carefully. But what I am saying is if a person takes and embraces the prophetic word of God, studies it, uses it, 
allows it to change and transform them for its intended purpose of making them more like Christ until he, until he returns. That, John tells us, is one of the things that gives us an assurance that we are genuine believers. Does that make sense to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense to me too. And it makes me a whole lot more bold about the prophetic word than I was two days ago. <laughs> because I, I believe it's a straight line, direct connection. All right, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Actually, uh, as we're turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, are there any questions? Any questions so far? Anything that I've said that you want clarified, that you would like to add to, that uh, you want to ask a question about? Any questions at all? Wow. Wow. No questions. All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Immediately following, immediately following the teaching on the, the rapture of the church, which we know from 1 Corinthians 15 also includes the resurrection of the church, Paul writes about the day of the Lord in verses 5 through 11. And I want you to, I want you to follow along as I read Uh, this extended uh, section as to what it has to say about the practical Christian life and living for Jesus Christ in the last days. Now, as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Earlier in chapter 1, I've already read it in... uh, Verse 10, I believe it is, uh, Paul wrote that we are to wait for uh, the return of Jesus Christ who delivers us from the wrath to come. So the second coming of Christ for the church will precede the wrath of God. It will precede uh, what we call the day of the Lord in certain contexts. Verse 3, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. Those who get drunk get drunk at night. For since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, here's what Paul's saying. You are believers. You are not unbelievers. You are believers. You are children of the light. You are children of the day. You should be spiritually prepared. You should be spiritually ready for the return of Christ. It's the unbelievers who are wandering around saying peace and safety And then the day of the Lord, you know, is going to be poured out upon them. And they're going to be totally unprepared because they did not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, notice in this eschatological passage that Paul calls them to put on the armor of God. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation a portion of the armor that he describes in some detail in Ephesians 6. There's actually three separate passages where Paul talks about the armor of God. And Pastor Steve and I will will actually be talking about that principle uh, in in some depth uh, down the road. That'll probably be uh, later on in the fall. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. He concludes this paragraph the same way he did the final paragraph of chapter 4. Encourage one another, and then he adds, build up or edify one another with, with this prophetic word. 
regarding the day of the Lord and the contrast between light and darkness. Okay, Pastor Steve, you're up. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mike. As we were talking about this class, we thought, wouldn't it be fun to tag team it? So we don't have any really hard and fast rules, although you ended on the dot. That's amazing. That's great. Uh, we all, we all we want to be open to some questions or discussion if that arises, but uh, I want to thank Mike for bringing to our attention some of these precious passages, and uh, I share his enthusiasm for the fact that we're in the last days, as well as a sense of urgency. How many of you would say that as you see things happen, you know, you're just, you're feeling this overwhelming sense of uh, anticipation, uh, anxiety is in there. Uh, the flesh is tested, the, the, our, our, uh, having to keep our eyes on Jesus and faith. I mean, all of that is going through the ringer and the heat right now. But I get more excited. I really honestly can say that we are living in exciting days. And uh, I do believe that he is coming soon. And I began to think as we were talking about uh, what to share here, uh, I thought, you know, we, we need to talk about the coming of the Lord. And if you look at that concept in the Bible, sometimes it's called parousia, I'm going to go ahead and read to you three passages that if you're taking notes, you can uh, uh, put it down. But it's the Greek word parousia, which means coming. It can mean an arrival onto a scene. It can mean an official visit. So if the president comes to your town, he's making a parousia. He's there on official duty to do something or to establish something. Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen? And that's what he was talking about. So when we talk about the coming, it can involve passages like 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. If you're writing these down. Matthew 24 and through 25. Uh, Revelation 19, 11, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. And you're going, why are we uh, spouting out those verses? Uh, because all of them talk about the second coming of our Lord. And now when we talk about the second coming, we think about it in as one event in two phases. Would that be pretty accurate as to what we look? What's the first phase of the second coming? When are we first going to see Jesus? At the rapture, right? And then we know that there's, a, there's a, a period of time after that, and we will be getting into some great discussions in this class. I know about how much time uh, we may believe is, is, is between the two phases of the second coming. But you'll have the rapture and then the second coming, where Jesus' feet actually touch down on the earth as he comes back with his saints in a flaming fire to take vengeance on his enemies. But we're waiting for the one, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm anticipating the one you know, where we meet him in the air. If this comes in my lifetime, I tell you, it, it, I, I think it's going to be so glorious and wonderful, we won't even really have time to process how great it's going to be when it happens, because the twinkling of an eye and, and these things like that. There are signs leading up to it, and as we see the signs happening, as we see all of these things, as we get closer, as Mike was saying, to the, to the coming of the Lord, then we need to have a more earnest drive to be pure, to be righteous and holy. So go with me to Titus for a moment. We're going to look at the book of Titus, and we're in chapter 2 of Titus, written in A.D. 66. Paul's writing to this man, Titus, and, and uh, appointing him essentially to go to Crete and put elders in place to set in order so that the church can function, so that the, the gospel can be spread and people can be discipled. And that's really the function of that. We're going to be talking about elders and deacons in this church as well um, in, uh, in some sermons coming up. But all of this, I believe, needs to be viewed in light of the fact that we are closer to the return of Jesus Christ today than even Paul was. Amen? How many of you believe that Paul believed in his lifetime uh, he would see Jesus again, very possibly, that, listen, man, get, be ready for it. And I'm telling you today, wow, we really need to be ready for it, because it's, you know, 2,000 years uh, uh, beyond that. But look at what he says in verses 1 through 10, very practical and uh, something that we at FBC are also going to uphold and continue to live by. If you're asking yourself this morning, what ministry could I have here? I want you to challenge yourself as we read uh, in a survey form, obviously. We won't be able to talk about all of it, but verses 1 through 10 of Titus chapter 2. He says, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate. 
I won't ask you to raise your hand if you think you're an older man this morning, or <laughs> definitely not an older woman in the next passage here. Don't raise your hand if you don't want to. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in perseverance. Now ask yourself, are you that type of an older man, or do you know that type of an older man? I hope we can all have people's names kind of flying into our head about this, uh, who mo model these qualities here at FBC. Verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, Sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Isn't that wonderful? I, I love these qualifications. I love these exhortations to be this type of people. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people looked at FBC and said, that's the most sensible, loving, temperate, kind, not drunkards, you know, all the things here. What a great testimony to have. That's what I think he's getting at with Titus. Urge bond slaves, verse 9, to be subject to their own masters and everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, don't steal from work, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Folks, what are, these are marching orders for believers in Jesus. Amen? We ought to, we ought to model and, and, and radiate. I keep using the word radiate today for some reason. But really show the world that we belong to Christ, we believe He's coming back soon, and therefore we need to have lives and church structures and everything that should reflect that we are serious about following God's Word. I love what Mike said, the, 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 the ground uh, work here in this class will be to uphold the Scriptures as our standard and to incorporate this obedience all the more as we see the day approaching, if you will. So let's get into the, my main point, the, the, the emphasis that I wanted to do. I've got one verse here, verse 13 out of verses 11 through 14. And we'll just take those verses one at a time quickly in Titus 2 because it kind of rounds out this whole thing. This was a list here of qualifications and things that we need to be doing. And we know that Christianity is what? Both being and doing, isn't it? Uh, you can do good deeds and yet not know Christ. You can, you can model things that look spiritual or holy and yet be completely lost. It's really, for those of us who know and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are Christians, we are saved, then we ought then to manifest these fruits. Now look, the reason would be why. Why is it so important for us to do this? Why put on the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect? Why be this way? Well, he says in verse 11, let's look at that one. For the grace of God has appeared. And some could translate that because the grace of God has appeared. In other words, here's the list for, for all that we ought to be showing and doing and, and what a healthy church looks like. And Titus, this is what I want you to, to teach the older men and the, and the older women and the young men and the, and the bond slave. They all need to get on board with what the Scriptures are commanding here, what the Holy Spirit has inspired Paul to, to instruct. Why? Because or for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. I want to stop right there for a moment. We have a past, present, and future picture in the next couple verses. And I love, I love when that happens. There's several other places that kind of happens in the Scripture. right? Paul says we, when you come together to do communion, it's a present act. You do what? You commemorate or you remember his death, which is a past act, until he comes, which is a future uh, thing there. Same thing here with these verses. Let's look at the past first. It says, the grace of God has appeared to all, uh, excuse me, yeah. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, this is an important thing for us to understand. When did the grace of God appear, or the word would be epiphino? You've ever met somebody who went, I had an epiphany the other day. Ever met, you know, they're going one direction in their life and, and some life-changing, earth-shattering thing happens to them and, and suddenly it's revealed. It shines upon them. They, 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 you know, the light comes on. They, they get it. That's an epiphany, right, as we use the word. Well, this word here, epiphino, is to be a shining upon or a, an appearing. And there's a picture, again, of radiance. 
When in the past did grace, did God's favor appear bringing salvation to all men? When Jesus came at His first coming. Amen? So the language here with, with the appearing uh, also has this idea of a person who appeared, and it's Jesus. We looked at that uh, the law came through Moses in John 1, but grace and truth, that's what Jesus Christ came manifesting. And when he went to the cross and he did what he did, it's the ultimate expression of grace that came upon us. Doing what? Bringing sotiro or salvation to all men. Everyone believing, the Bible says, that in Jesus will have eternal life. And his grace has appeared. God's grace has appeared. Now look how this works out, though. What are we to learn from the first coming of Christ and, and the coming when he brought salvation to us? Look at verse 12. It's instructing us. God's grace is instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live, there's this word again, sensibly, or sophronos, right? Discreetly, soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Remember the past, the grace has appeared. Now it instructs us in the future to what? Live this way. Be sober, be righteous, be godly. But the idea here is we have to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. We've talked a lot about this, and you'll hear me often reference it, because I feel like, can I be honest with you again this morning, I feel like I'm in the fight of my life at this stage in my life. Anybody know what I mean by that? We have a wonderful growing church. We love the Lord Jesus. How about I'm watching friends of mine drop like flies left and right of me. I'm watching pastors. I'm watching missionaries. I'm watching associates in ministry. I'm watching people that used to be faithful. I'm watching kids that were in my youth groups. I'm watching uh, you know, people in the Grace Brethren. I, you know, and I, I'm sorry, I keep bringing it up, but I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's a, a litany of uh, downfalls. And I'm, Satan is gunning for the church. And if you don't think he has his crosshairs on a group of people who want to be around the Scriptures in these last days and do these things, let me tell you, he's bringing out all the stops of temptation to try to get us to fall. And Paul says here, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is what God wants us to do, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And I follow that question up with you this morning. How hard is that? It's rough. But nonetheless, that's what we're called to do and live lives of sensibility, of righteousness, and godliness. Now, we know what righteously and godly means. But in this present age, it says, in the noon ioni, right, You've got the past, the grace has appeared, but now in this present age, our lives should be, just as Mike exhorted us, pure and righteous in light of his return. Look at the last one here about the future. This would probably be the key verse here, verse 13, and I have it written up here. Looking, this is how we ought to be, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus, or Christ Jesus. Now, this is interesting because this may be, and I believe it is, one of the greatest and most clear verses about Jesus is God, our God and Savior. And there's a debate among some people that, that this, this is talking about two different things, our great God and the Savior, Christ Jesus. But there is no definite article here in the Greek. It seems to be saying that God and Savior are one and the same found in Christ Jesus here. And uh, Ambrose and some other uh, church fathers and things used to argue that very point uh, on the deity of Christ from this verse. So it's a really good one to remember. But notice here the first part of it, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing. This is not the word per parousia. This is the epiphina word. Okay? And it's going to be a glorious appearing, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. When he comes back, he wanted us to know, Matthew 16, 27, Mark 8, 38, I am coming in the glory of my Father. When Jesus returns, it is going to be glorious. Amen? It's not, he's not coming back again as the suffering servant anymore. He's not going to come back and be persecuted and crucified anymore. He's coming in the clouds, and he's going to be powerful and beautiful and mind-blowingly, stunningly, uh, just emanating this power because he is our God and Savior. What is Paul saying? Well, he's appeared once, and that was glorious, wasn't it? it really was. 
Apostles say, they, they, well, they write, you know, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus' first coming was glorious. Jesus' second coming is going to be spectacularly glorious. And we, hopefully, like in our lifetime, if we see him in the air, if he raptures us and we meet him in the air along with all of our dead loved ones that, that died in Christ, we'll have that wonderful reunion. That's going to be glorious. I can't think of anything uh, better than to wrap up my time here, amen, as to make it in the rapture. But the second coming where we come back with him, apparently, is also going to be, we're going to have front row seats to the glorious return of Jesus. Now, let's wrap it up in the Titus passage here. He says, there's the future aspect of it. We're still looking for what he calls here the blessed hope and the appearing. And that should be what motivates us to live godly and righteous in this present age, as Mike so aptly shared with us. He who has this hope in him purifies himself. We have the hope, the blessed hope, that he is coming, and it will be glorious. Now, how do I say that? How do I promise you that? By faith. Amen? Skeptics going to go, well, you people are deceived from, from day one. You, you, don't, you know, how can we believe anything in the Bible? And, and how come you're holding out for this thing? You know what? I'm holding out for it, because by faith, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm embracing it. That's going to be the greatest thing that ever, ever happens. It's going to be his return. And it's going to set everything right, and it's going to be amazing in our life. But that's the idea here as we are looking for the epiphany, the glorious display. This word here appearing uh, occurs six times, and it's always of Christ's coming. 2 Timothy 1.10 uses it of his first coming, okay, an epiphany. But the other times, it's always used of the coming of Christ. The last verse in this passage, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. And he closes, this chapter closes with saying, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Folks, these are important words. We need to live in the present age in light of what happened to us in the past and what God did and, and we look backwards and we see what happened on Calvary and the resurrection, and we embrace that by faith. We live, it changes the way we live and act here in the godly age, or in the present age, with the power of the Holy Spirit helping us in our sanctification. And then what are we looking for? We're looking forward to the day of glorification and the return of Jesus, which is going to be great. Who's more excited today than you were, as Mike said, two days ago? As God continues to unfold his word to us, we have a blessed hope. The world sorrows as those who do not have hope. And that bothers me when I see it. That should motivate us to say, but wait, there is hope. And it's bound up in the certainty by faith of the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go to one more uh, a parable here for a moment. And then if we have any questions, uh, I know John's, John told us today he's going to 4 p.m., so we have a long time to, just joking, time flies up here, man. I don't know if you notice. I'm like completely, I better go to my second pageant. Let's go to Luke chapter 19 for a moment. If you want to put a title in the first part of what I said, expectant until he comes. This part would be, or we could call it occupation until he comes. We ought to be about the business that God has called us to be as his church until he comes. And many of you may remember this uh, awesome parable. Look at Luke 19. The first 10 verses talk about the radical salvation of Zacchaeus. What did Jesus say at the end of this, uh, uh, as this tax collector believes on him, he says, what? Salvation has come to this house today, right? Verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. How many of you love that verse? I love it because I was lost and he found me. And it wasn't me loving him first. It wasn't me seeking him out as much as it was him, what? Seeking me out and calling me. And I, and I could, you know, even as a, as a child, I came to Christ with an awareness that I was being saved from some evil that I was very, well, I was made aware of from Scripture. Uh, I'll tell you that story sometime. And I discovered as I grew how much I'd been saved from. Amen. But Zacchaeus gets radically saved. Salvation comes to the house today, and, uh, and, and the Son of Man, uh, Jesus, talks about his mission. And this prompts his disciples to begin to 
talk and speculate and, uh, in my opinion, get off on the wrong track here. Look at verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Why did he tell the parable? Because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. There it is. We really cannot escape it in the life of Jesus or even in the time of the apostles, the early church, and all the way up to the present day. There are people who have extreme misconceptions about the kingdom of God, don't they? And here we have the kingdom now philosophy, right? We're going to Jerusalem. Hey, that's the city of the great Mashiach who's going to sit on the throne. And, 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 and we're, we're buying into the fact that it's, it's Yeshua. Uh, we're going to go there. Oh, he's going to bring the kingdom immediately. And that's what they wanted, wasn't it? The triumphal entry that had happened, that's what it was. Save now. Bring, bring us prosperity now. Bring us the kingdom now. And Jesus is telling, no, it's coming. But So you have to, you have, to have the perspective that you're going to do what it is that you've been left here to do. Remember, uh, or my dad used to say all the time, uh, now maybe you've heard this a lot, but people were like, well, how come, how come we didn't just get immediately translated into glory when we got saved? Anybody ever wonder that? Why we got to go through all the rest of the, you know, the struggles of the Christian life? And, and that whole idea was because we are to be about the business that God has called us to. That's what this parable is about. I'm going to read the whole parable for you, and then we're just going to talk about a, a couple words up here. Jesus tells this parable because they were near Jerusalem and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, verse 12, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Already, what do we know? Jesus is talking about, okay, himself. That's what he's going to do. He's going to go away and then what? Receive a kingdom, then return, or he's going to bring that kingdom. He called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas. How many of you would like a mina or two in your wallet? You would, because 10 minas is 10, 10 uh, uh, allotments of a three-month salary, right? So 30 months worth of wages. He says, I'm going away. So he imparts to 10 of his slaves 10 minas each, and he says to them, very important, which our verse is up here, do business with this until I come back. Now, we've got to talk about this word, occupy, some of your Bibles might say, occupy until I come. And the dominionists and the kingdom now people have taken this to be like, oh, so we're supposed to build the kingdom so he can come back to it. And that is a complete misinterpretation of what Jesus is doing here. He's giving them resources, and he's saying in this Greek word, do you want me to write it for you? Because it's really fun. I can't imagine uh, the proper uh, pronunciation here, but pragma, oh, this is good. I don't even remember how to write it. And it just keeps going. I need another board. <laughs> pragma to saste. Pragma to saste. That's what he says when he says, do business with this money until I come back. But it can also be translated it, it, with the word pragma here means a necessary matter, something needful. This is what I'm commanding you as the king to do. And it's, it can be translated a variety of ways. I looked at a couple translations in Bibles and in, in, the, commentary, in the, uh, the lexicons, and it's put this to work, transact business with this, trade this, invest this, engage in some sort of a business, do business, occupy, and I added my own little kind of translation here, make it work. <laughs> That's what he said. Here's a big wad of cash for all 10 of you. Make it work until when? I return. Now, this is important. Jesus is already, in my opinion, in that first verse here that we read, in verse 12, he's saying a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. I'm already in the mindset of Jesus is talking about his return. And in the meantime, the nobleman gives them a nice chunk of change and says, do all of this until I come back. Let's finish. Look at verse 14. But his citizens hated him. They sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Boy, isn't that the attitude of people against Jesus, right? When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over 10 cities. The second came saying, your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. 
Another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, by your own words, I'll judge you. You worthless slave. Did you know that I'm, ex- don't, did you know that I'm an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put the money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. And I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. And then they go on to Jerusalem. Now, obviously, and again, I, I messed up what I said in the beginning there. Not each, each servant did not receive 10 minas each. They each received a mina, which is three months' salary. Still a good deal, right? Amen? But some of them invested. Some of them pragma to saste it. They did it. And then when he came back, they had what? Fruit to show for it. We know the story, don't we? Faithful stewardship involving sound investment and multiplication with allotted resources in light of the master's return. That's what the parable is about. What does it say to us here this morning and at FBC and as Christians that you know what? We must be stewards over what our master has entrusted to us because what? He will certainly return, bring in the kingdom. Amen? All of this fits perfectly, in my opinion, with what when, when uh, uh, Mike and I met this week and we just said, what is this thing that we need to talk about at the, at the very first class? And that is this preparation for the coming and how that affects our life. And I promise you, your opinion, uh, your viewpoint at this point about when and, and why and, and all the aspects surrounding Jesus' certain return will affect how you live your Christian life. And I've got friends that are sitting in churches that are never, ever, any, on any given Sunday ever, warned that the coming of Christ could be soon, that when He comes, we will have to give an account, which is the other aspect in this thing. I mean, how many of you understand you know, that the parable is not speaking in exact words about who Christ is? Because after all, this master in the parable was a very severe man who, again, reaped where he did not sow. Not, not generally uh, you know, a righteous aspect, but Jesus even has the right to do any of that. Amen? Jesus, to him belongs all sovereignty and all glory. And anything done in his name will be rewarded. And so you and I, we long to see Jesus, but we ought to also increasingly in these last days long to please Jesus because he sees us. He is coming back. If we believe in that, then we must live in light of that and not be like the foolish slave. I just have to say, at the end of the thing, the last line is a haunting one in this parable. Verse 27, But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Notice the slaves that were in his household got rewarded or got punished. They suffered loss, and so too we shall. Uh, Someday, I believe, we're going to find out really quick with some tears. Before all tears are wiped away, which they will, amen? Before that, though, is there a possibility that we're going to be cut to the heart as we see what we've squandered and should have utilized for the Lord? Amen? All the opportunities that we talk about and the things that we don't do for the Lord. Uh, Matthew 25, you know, he says, there's sheep on my right, goats on my left, and the basis upon which that he kind of rendered what they were, and it's not a works righteousness thing here, but he definitely judged and said, one of the earmarks of being a goat is that you didn't do anything for me. You didn't reflect a life that had any sort of a change because there was no reality in relationship. We don't want to be a goat, and we also don't want to be unfruitful sheep. Amen? We definitely don't want to be the rebels in this story who said, we don't want this man to reign over us. And when we don't submit to the master's command to occupy until he returns, we are in effect setting ourselves in rebellion against what we should be doing as God's people. Amen? We'll stop there and uh, 
I think we have, you know, five or ten minutes if you want to come back up here and if you have any questions for either one of us, or if you have any question I can't answer, I'm going to have Mike answer it. <laughs> Simple as that. But um, does anybody here, uh, you know, maybe we could have some suggestions about how, or, or just a testimony about, you know, your struggle to maybe discover what the Lord wants for you to do, or uh, let's just be honest, the, the difficulty of obedience sometimes uh, in light of the world we live. We don't, get, we, don't get, we're, we don't have a really supportive culture to be righteous, holy, sober, and good stewards. Um, anybody have any questions or comments about anything that we shared today? Ooh, what do you think? Well, in, the word witness actually means martyr. Uh, so I think it, yeah, okay, the question was, uh, well, the first observation that you made was that the scriptures inform us about what we need to be doing, and you t- I think you were kind of referencing priorities in, in that, you know, spirit, things of spiritual value over and above what? The passing pleasures of everything else. And I, I admit, and I might weigh in here if you want, but, uh, uh, you know, I have a struggle prioritizing things that are of eternal value as opposed to temporal things. And let me just say, there's a huge area in my life of worry sometimes, right? Isn't that the, that's, and that's kind of like a absolute focus on the things that don't matter uh, and, and, and we're in anguish over it and we're fearful and that prevents us from doing those things and being used by God to, to, to accomplish the more important things. And there's all other kinds of things we can plug in there that hinder that. The second observation you kind of made was that a witness and a martyr, uh, and again, in, in the Greek, the word witness is martyr. So I think it carried with it, in that meaning, a laying down of one's own, you know, scenario, a, a willing to risk, uh, if you will, for uh, taking a stand, you know, to, to profess publicly Jesus Christ meant what? Persecution, for sure. And I think that translates today as well. I don't think we can say that we're witnessing if we're not willing to suffer. That's where I would bring that in. Do you have anything? Uh, no, that's... That's the reality of it. If, if you're going to be a witness of Jesus Christ, then the promise is we will be persecuted, mm-hmm. and some, it will, be, it will cost them their lives in the providence of God. Thank you, man. Any other observations? Or? Very wonderful observation. And this word right here, again, this means of, necess- of necessity or something necessary. And it can be positive in the sense of it's, it's things done or how to do something, uh, you know, that's of a needful thing. And there are a lot of commands in Scripture that we need to do. But we have today what is reigning in a lot of churches, and you diagnosed it very accurately, and that is what's called pragmatism. If it works, do it. Doesn't matter if it's in accordance with God's Word. If, it's, if it works, and see Peter Wagner of Fuller Seminary and uh, the New Apostolic Reformation was very famous for bringing up uh, one of the early analogies. He says, if I have a computer and I want to do something, I get the right program, I get the right software, and it does what I tell it to do. And he said, the church is the same way. All we have to do is find out how to get more people in it, and we do these certain things, and it'll happen. And the problem is, you can run a business like that, you can run you know, all, all manner of, of, of things function but we have a higher priority, if you will, and that is the parameters that God's Word set. And what does He tell us? Jesus said, I will build my church. And all of the other activities and the programs, and if they get the glory, then we're doing it wrong. We've, we've, we've missed the entire point that we're to submit to the head as the body and allow Him to nourish, guide, and do the building. We need to keep each other so accountable on the leadership from leadership on to, to, the, to the whole church, we need to keep everyone who teaches here. And if you're ministering, and, and we've got to keep Jesus as the head and the focus of what we do, or it is a house built in vain. It is a house built, and we could build it. We could make an empire. We could, you know, if God permitted, we could, we could have a huge organization that, you know, branches out and has, has plants and satellites and everything else. And so much can be done in the flesh, and people today many times translate earthly success as the blessing of God, and you're exactly right. It can be done from completely wrong motives. So 
we need to hold each other accountable to this word. And uh, the Holy Spirit will, will guide us, you know, as we uh, seek to do what we're supposed to do, to occupy. And we'll, we'll do the right pragma, uh, you know, in association to what God says we need to do. So being and doing, important for us, but we got to have those two uh, connected, you know. Anybody else? Any observation or anything? If not, we'll close in a word of prayer. All right, Mike, you want to close us? Okay. Prayer, man. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to this place and study your word and reflect upon the Christian life. Father, we ask that we might recognize that your word is sufficient, that your spirit is sufficient. Mm -hmm. Father, help us to take the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, to a world that desperately needs to hear it. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming, and uh, stay tuned. We're, we're going to be working out different formats. There'll be some where he and I are going to share at the same time. There's going to be others where we kind of trade off and do whatever. And uh, as always, bring your questions for discussion, and we'll do that. Next week, I will draw a picture. <laughs>